progress to bigger boats on bigger rivers. Through Loch Ree, a Sahara desert of water, some digressions into history and some foul weather. Through Lanesborough and a view of an industrial future, upstream against the Shannon Current, a journey from tomorrow into yesterday. This is the oil canal. Most of the world has been used for nearly half a century, and none of us ever tried. So there's a sense of novelty as well. The lock chambers are 10 feet long on the familiar Grand Canal. They seem a little strange, out of port. That's what this journey is coming to mean. A voyage to familiar places that is all the same, a voyage discovery. Then suddenly we seem to be lost in the jungle. The banks are so lush, silences. doing and just look around. Half afraid, paisley patterned serpents and small brown faces in and arrows. It's beautiful, very beautiful, but it's not comfortable, a little too exotic, a feast for the eyes that may lead to indigestion. feel a bit dizzy. I'm unsure of the points of the compass as we glide up this lost canal, where human structures have the forlorn appearance of Mayan ruins in the rainforest. There are signs of past industry looming up. This was a Victorian powerhouse of activity, with a distillery that produced 70,000 gallons of whiskey a year, a mill, and the Boston Harbor. Today, there's nothing very much. There's a poignancy to industrial archaeology a sadness about derelict industry. And there's a particular cloud of sadness hanging over this place, because Richmond Harbor in the 1840s and 50s was the great port of departure for emigrants from the North Midlands. Thousands of men, women, and children, fleeing famine, abandoned everything familiar for a desperate chance at a new life in a new world. And those who stayed at home built up a deposit of grief for lost family. I'm sensitive to this legacy from the past, but aware of another agenda. The Royal Canal the other canal was a mistake, a cul-de-sac of early capitalism. From the start, it was a controversial undertaking, and Richmond Harbor is still, to some extent, a monument to failure. Richmond Harbour is the terminus of the Royal Canal, which links the northern end of the Shannon with Dublin, unlike the Grand Canal, which links Dublin with the Shannon round about the middle of the river, just north of Banagher. It's an interesting canal because uh, the, the story about it is that it was 
constructed out of peak by a, a, a ex-director of the Grand Canal Company who stormed out of his board meeting and said he was going to construct a rival canal. But the canal itself was an extraordinarily difficult canal to construct, partly because it was never really properly surveyed and they launched into building it without making correct plans and surveys of the route. And they ran into enormous financial difficulties. And so the government instituted a major inquiry into both canal companies and finally wound up the Royal Canal Company and completed the canal to the Shannon using public funds. And then in the 1840s, the entire concern was bought by the newly set up Midland Great, Great Western Railway Company. And this, of course, was the beginning of the end for the canal as a commercial concern. The 18th century was the age of enlightenment and the seedbed for recession. But a commercial venture that lurched in a series of bad judgments into bankruptcy and dereliction is now being restored by engineers with a self-confident vision of a new kind of prosperity. We have a job, but it's a fairly easy job uh, in this direct, direct area. Uh, we've only got the canal to dredge, uh, the old lock gates to take out, and the new lock gates to put in. Uh, in other locations of the canal, we have uh, a few low bridges. Uh, they will cause uh, more problems, but uh, nothing insurmountable. Well, the rate of restoration will depend on the resources that are made available, both financial and labour resources. Uh, but uh, it will be possibly uh, in the, within the next 10 years or so. The locks will be restored as they were. Uh, timber will be mainly used, but we will also use steel. Well, hopefully I'll be in the first boat that travels on the canal from Richmond Harbour to Dublin or vice versa. But uh, it's something I look forward to. Superhouse minimum speed seems far too fast along here. She seems at home though. She was born in Holland 80 years ago and this Flemish landscape suits her. This is one of the lonelier passages on the journey. We haven't seen another boat for hours. For me, these are always the best bits. I find the wealth of wildlife better company. Well, there's quite a lot of butterflies. The Shannon is a very good area for butterflies. The main reason for that is that there is quite an array of plants. And an area like we're in now, which is an overgrown wilderness, is absolutely ideal for butterflies. If you tried to create it, you couldn't do a better job than nature's done here. Generally, the life of a butterfly is about a fortnight. There's three exceptions to this, the brimstone, the peacock and the small tortoiseshell. These butterflies hibernate, but all of them have exactly the same life cycle. It starts with the butterfly laying an egg, and the butterfly can lay up to 250 eggs. In the wild, probably one, maybe two butterflies will be all that will emerge through at the end of the life cycle. But it goes from the egg to a caterpillar. And an interesting little aside is that a caterpillar eats so much that if you were to, to relate that to human terms, if a baby ate what a caterpillar eats, he'd be 10 tonnes weight by the time that same baby was a week old. This year we have the clouded yellow, which is a migrant butterfly. It's rarely seen, but this year it's along all the shores of the Shannon. And also the brimstone, which is another bright yellow butterfly. And in fact, that's the, where the name butterfly came from. This bright yellow butterfly in Victorian times, people used to say, look at the butter-coloured fly. 
It is felt that the protection that a butterfly gets is often by a flash of colour and the theory is that that confuses the predator and in the case of the eye spots that you can see on the peacock butterfly, this eye spot is designed again to frighten a bird or in some cases to act as a mimic eye so that if a bird pecks at the eye, all that happens to the butterfly is that he has a torn wing rather than losing his head which is really where his eyes are. Trying not to lose my head, I waltz around the Camlin River bends, getting pleasure from the challenge of it, enjoying boating in the sunshine. Some of the alder trees are dead. This worries me. Is it the effect of drought or a virus? Is something unsound in this apparent paradise? then I forget about it. It's impossible to really worry about anything on a glorious river, on a glorious day, in good company. If you have something preying on your mind, anything, however weighty, I guarantee you peace and absolution if you open yourself up to an experience as beautiful as this. Irish waterways form corridors of wilderness across the country, narrow strips where birds, animals and plants have it their own way. Dick Carney, Declan and I feel like privileged visitors in someone else's place. We don't say much, maybe something articulate like, it's great, isn't it? And it is. I stop to rest muscles tired out by the heavy tiller and get a closer look at the bankside riches. Alder is an excellent tree. It fixes its own nitrogen like peas and beans, so it can pioneer wet soils, poor in nutrients. The spikes of purple loosestrife make bold strokes of colour in the green tapestry. The white umbellifers are hard plants to identify. This one is wild angelica, an edible plant but dangerous because it has some poisonous look-alikes. Oh, and this is interesting, a flowering head of hempagrimony, the only member of the cannabis family that grows wild outside the tropics. And our diversion is over. Scolivar sticks her blunt nose out of the Camlin River onto the Shannon again. Loch Forbes opens up. There's amazing variety to this navigation from tight canals and narrow twisting river stretches to this, all in the space of half a day. The closer the banks are, the more you're in touch with the plants and animals. But even Loch Forbes has a wildlife tale to tell. It lies in hiding, up a tree, on an old estate on the lake shore. This, this site here on the Shannon was really the beginning of one of the most dynamic things that's happened in um, mammalogy in Ireland in the last, um, in the last century. 
really. The addition of a completely new and very successful species. What happened was that the Earls of Granard, a daughter of the house, was getting married in 1911. And amongst her wedding presents, there was a hamper of gray, squ gray squirrels sent over by the Duke of Bedford from Woburn Abbey, now a famous wildlife park, and obviously even then in the business of exporting wildlife. And as part of the wedding celebrations, the hamper was open and the squirrels scampered off into the beech trees here. And um, from that single reintroduction, the species has spread over the whole of the Midlands of Ireland and is now um, way down into Munster. Around the Shannon, we have estate woodlands, hedgerow woodlands, mixed woodlands, a lot of beech, a lot of ash, a lot of oak by Irish standards. And this is where the grey squirrel survives because that's what it comes from. It comes from this sort of habitat in, in North America. If you read the early literature, you'll find um, people who um, averred passionately that not only did the grey squirrel, which is bigger than the red squirrel, chase the red squirrel out of its uh, native habitat, but also when they caught the red squirrels, they used to emasculate them, they used to bite the testicles off and then let the red squirrels go again. Um, for which there is, I'm, I'm afraid, no evidence whatsoever, but it's, a, it's, it's an example of, the, if you like, the Victorian imagination running a little, a little wild. So what seems to happen is that in the habitats for which they're better suited, the grey squirrel will quietly exclude the red. the realities of civilization after our short retreat on practical things like needing diesel to keep Skolivar motoring against the current. This isn't country anymore, it's country and western, midwestern. Pepsi Cola and popsicles have replaced peacock butterflies and pastoralism. I suppose that now we're sucking diesel. After a few days of travelling like this, your brain begins to interpret signals in another way. Visual perception is a very subjective thing, which I guess is another way of saying that everyone sees things differently. The Flemish master who painted the skies along the Camlin River has retired his easel, and another landscape school has taken over. I can't quite place this one. Maybe Jack Yates around the time he was starting to take liberties with colour. there's another change. A mad surrealist welcomes us to Ireland's strangest shop, the Drummond Mariner. This is through the looking glass, from Mary Lou in Disneyland to Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. It's so strange the proprietor takes pains to discourage custom and fines you a pound if you still dare to penetrate the door to look at the treasures inside. Oh, we get all sorts of customers. <laughs> we charge a pound to keep them out, you see. We're very allergic to the poor ones, you know, the poor people are all a nuisance. But then, of course, the millionaire, he's very shy. He's very shy to give me the pound either. Like, I, I noticed a lot of you fellas today didn't pay. So what can I do about it? God help us. Bound in the of war and the stroke. Got many a bit. Sure, so I'm a, 
I'll meet the Queen's Arnold. Where have I got to? A sleep, maybe? A character in Alice's dream? Well, when I first came here 25 years ago, you had a lot of rich people came on those boats. But now you get an awful lot of jackines on there, you see. They hire a boat for four and about eight or ten of them on it. And they'd move, they're the greatest movers I ever met. They'd move everything on you, you know. And wouldn't be, be, would be very reluctant to pay for it. Buy a watch for the Mad March Hare, or a top hat for ten and sixpence. They hire these boats, you see, and then they've got no money to spend, so they're not much good to me, are they? An awful lot of rubbish comes out of that river. An awful lot of... Of course, there are some lovely things come out of it, too. God bless their little hearts. Some lovely little things. Oh, my God, yes. I leave, unsure whether I'm one of the lovely things. One thing's certain, the North Midlands of Ireland are a great place for the colourful and the exotic. Let's travel on. Tazanadu?